real time and to Little Round Top. My name is Bert Barnett and what brings us to Little Round Top right here is the afternoon crisis du jour of the Union Army. When the Federal Army is looking to extend its hold, anchor itself as the line of battle has grown, has extended with the arrival of different corps of the Union Army, the remnants of the 1st and 11th Corps placing itself on Cemetery Hill and the northern portion of Cemetery Ridge, that 1st and 11th Corps. If you look up in that direction, you'll be able to see a white turquoise colored water tank right there at the end of your field division, right up there buried a little bit in the trees, slightly to the east there. From that position, looking down, you'll be able to see the dome of the Pennsylvania Memorial. So you have the remnants of the 1st and 11th Corps on that high ground. Then moving to the south, you have the 2nd Corps, Winfield Scott Hancock, occupying and extending down there. The fellow commanding the 3rd Corps has come from the southeast, off in that direction. Daniel Edgar Sickles, he moves his men from the south under orders coming up. And he will take the Emmitsburg Road coming up that direction until he reaches the Wheatfield Road, which rises out of the low ground, the trees, off in that direction. He will come down into the low ground to the south of the Pennsylvania Memorial. His job, his orders are to extend and connect between the left of the Second Corps and the large anchor, the large rock that we're all standing on right now. But he does not have enough men to maintain a solid connection on top of this, but he does have enough men, about 9,000 men in his two divisions of the Third Corps to anchor and secure by pressing against the uh, flank of the side of Little Round Top here. Now, as the Federals have been moving men up from the south, up in this direction along the Tawny Town Road behind the tree line here, they're very much aware of this. This is not a surprise to them. They actually have a signal corps outpost on the top of this hill with this location and this vision giving them a good lookout on the entire terrain around here. They will not have that same sort of vista from Big Round Top to the south because Big Round Top is still entirely tree covered and useless to them in that regard. However, the local folks don't like to freeze in the wintertime any more than anybody else does and they have stripped the western face of Little Round Top in the fall of 1862 not many trees on it, very clear, very good utilization for men and some artillery, and so it's more militarily useful for the Army of the Potomac. As they will take note of this, one of the things that happens is Sickles will take note of this as well, because down in the low ground out here, one of the things he is concerned about is the extending Confederate line, which you will be able to see across the open ground, across the way there, if you'll look where I am pointing, you will see a red barn with three spires on the top of it. Everybody see that? Okay, beyond that, on the far side of the tree line, you will see one single spire as well. That is the uh, modern church spire on the Lutheran Theological Seminary uh, building area. And that's where the first corps got pushed back from on the first day. But that ridge line extending down to the south is where the Confederates are building their army the same way the Federals are building theirs. As more men are coming into the area, they are pushing their line down to the south. So Sickles is very concerned about that mid-level ridge that he actually turned off of off the Emmitsburg Road. Now that he's in low ground, he's kind of concerned about that. Sickles is an interesting fellow. For those of you who do not know him, and I usually pick that out by the folks that do not chuckle at this point. Uh, yeah. Those folks yeah. will know that he is the only non-USMA graduate to command a corps in the Army of the Potomac. He actually is minted by Congress, and we know what sort of folks come out of Congress. Uh, he actually is a very intense fellow, studies a whole lot, and when he is uh, looking to move from Congress to the White House, he will uh, be very, very focused in that endeavor, and he will lead Mrs. Sickles to do what Mrs. Sickles does, and in this case, Mrs. Sickles is looking to find other things to do, and she succeeds in that. Word of that gossip eventually will agitate Mr. Sickles, 
who will finally get arrested for shooting his wife's lover. So uh, he is not a product of the discipline, the drill, and that sort of thing that marks the regular military officers that rank as corps commanders in the Army of the Potomac. So at any rate, when he is told to hold the low ground down here because he only has 9,000 men, the last division of the Third Corps is down at Harper's Ferry holding it at this point in time, he begins to look askance back at the high ground in the middle between the two lines, and he begins to worry. He begins to worry that the Confederates might extend their holdings across the fields onto that little ridge and shell his men, because that's what happened to him at the last battle prior to the Battle of Gettysburg and Battle of Chancellorsville. And so he will begin to send messages up the road back towards General Meade and his headquarters. Don't you think we ought to take concern about that? Don't you think somebody ought to send men out there? Don't you think I ought to move some troops out there to seize that land? And of course, Sickles is uh, kind of plaintive in these messages, and Meade is not too focused on them at this point. Ultimately, Sickles will decide, uh, I'm an important fellow, I'm a politician, I'm in command of an entire corps of the Army of the Potomac. Ultimately, he will decide by his very self that what he needs to do is seize the moment, and he will move his 9,000 men forward from the anchored position, solid on Little Round Top, solid connected to the Second Corps, out to the apex of Wheatfield Road and what's called the Peach Orchard, which connects out to the Emmitsburg Road and sees that little ridge in the middle. But you can't bend 9,000 men and do that and still have a solid anchor on both of those positions. So Sickles will wind up positioning his men in a different location. If we all look down in that direction, you will see a clumping of rocks known in history now as Devil's Den. Sickles will decide that that's going to be, in, since it's in front of Little Roundup, that that will serve as the anchor for his line, and he will move some of his men from that position. That's the anchor going down into the rough ground, back up at an angle back towards the Peach Orchard. And it's kind of hard to see the Peach Orchard proper, but if you look through the gap, roughly in that direction, imagine that where the Wheatfield Road intersects with the with the uh, Emmitsburg Road on that high ground. That's roughly where it is. But immediately just to get that one connection, you will have to take uh, the 1st Division of the 3rd Corps and stretch it to the point that it actually breaks in a couple places so that his three brigades of that 1st Division will be able to stand on a roughly straight line to be able to do that. Same thing with his 2nd Division. And Alexander Humphreys is the fellow commanding that 2nd Division. And he also will wind up having a few breaks in his line as his line extends up the Emmitsburg Road. And again, he will wind up also being about 800 yards in front and separated from the Second Corps. So again, you've got a lot of ventilation holes, if you will, uh, as that section begins to move up according to Sickles' orders. And when he does that, it's going to be a very large, obvious violation of the orders that he had been given by General Meade. Meade will finally decide at this point, yes, I need to go pay attention to my Aaron Corps commander. And at that point, uh, there will be, who do we send down here? And that fellow that they send down here will be the gentleman you see on the rock here with his back turned toward us, Governor K. Warren, the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac. Warren will ride down here, and for years, Warren is the fellow who is credited to be the savior of Little Round Top because Warren is the fellow who rides down here and sees the only folks actually physically on Little Round Top are a few folks with torches, with lamps, uh, the Signal Corps outpost that I mentioned earlier, Captain Hall in command of that outfit. Now, one of the great things about Governor K. Warren, he is very much a professional uh, engineer, can look out at this landscape in just a moment. He needs a couple of things to confirm just what the bad situation of the federal left is at that moment. He knows that there are federal troops down at that uh, Devil's Den area. He knows that there's a battery of artillery down there, and he will send a messenger down to one of those cannons down there that fire a shot off in that direction into the trees out there. And they will do that. They will fire a single artillery shell way off into the distance. And according to Warren's story, upon which this sculpture is based, 
when that single shot is fired off into that distance, the Confederate soldiers with their bright shiny muskets up while at right shoulder shift will crane their neck. Now these are all hard bitten Confederate veterans by the way. Will all crane their necks to watch this single hunk of iron fly harmlessly past them. And at that point, the sun beating down on those barrels will reflect and Warren, who has uncased his binoculars and is looking intently down in that direction, will see that shining metal through the trees and that will indicate to him, oh Lord, there's all sorts of Confederates down back through there and this position is in danger. So the name of that sculpture is Moment of Recognition. But there's another voice out here and that is of Captain Hall commanding the Signal Corps post out here. And Captain Hall has a different opinion of what takes place up here. Captain Hall, when Warren rides up to the station, first thing he tries to do is get Warren off of his horse. And he basically says, hey, you idiot, they're already shelling the position. Get off the horse, quit being a target. Because <laughs> shells are bursting, rocks are skittling around here. And according to Hall's version of it, one of those burst shells or a rock from a nearby shell burst will hit Warren in the neck. And so a moment of recognition would actually look very unartistic, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, moment of recognition is achieved and Warren now rides off because he now has a message to send back to headquarters. They need men on this position as many as they can find, as quickly as they can find them. And so that will now begin to travel down the chain of communication so that they can get folks here as quickly as they can. And that's good news for us because we will now head off of this position and a little bit more into the shade. So we're going to head off that way. One of the things about a quote-unquote real-time program on the anniversary of the battle 155 years after the effect is that we try and get these things in a flexible way so that you can go from one to the other to the other without spending the amount of time at each particular uh, event. So we're going to have to amputate several facts of this particular thing uh, without giving it the total justice it deserves. Warren goes back, tries to find the proper fellow in the chain of command for the 5th Corps. The word trickles down to a fellow by the name of Strong Vincent, who is, uh, in spite of his uh, uh, predisposition amongst the modern uh, era, how many how many of you folks have a, a positive impression on lawyers, unless you are one? <laughs> <laughs> Strong Vincent is a very sharp lawyer, uh, goes to Trinity College in Connecticut, and then finishes up at Harvard. So when he gets this sense that there's something in the air, uh, he manages to hijack a messenger and says, what's going on? Realizes the crisis at hand, gets the sense that he needs to move his brigade of soldiers to this particular place, does so, throws them out onto the southwest face of Little Round Top, just in time to receive the advance of the Confederates who have moved from three quarters of a mile to the southwest coming in this direction. And his particular brigade is only a relatively small force in the face of the Confederate attack overall. But that Confederate attack extends across the Emmitsburg Road and has come 28 miles in 11 hours to get here before launching their attack in weather not terribly dissimilar than this. They will send about 22 guys out looking for water at Plum Run, and all of those guys with canteens will become prisoners. They will get caught. So the guys getting ready to launch that attack will deprive all of the rest of those Confederates of the chance to do what many of you are doing with those crinkling little bottles. <laughs> and they are wearing long cotton shirts, long woolen jackets, And the ones on the end of the line, the guys in the 15th Alabama, will wind up actually having to climb Big Round Top, which is back over there. And one of the things about having this job is they say, you want to talk about something, you got to go do it. And so we get to climb Big Round Top when we first get this job. 
sling a musket over your shoulders and then you have to use all four appendages to do that. Get off the top, go across the top. There's a stunning view of Route 15 from the top of there. Uh, and then descend and that takes you a while. And those exhausted Confederate soldiers wound up when they got up there having their minds twisted a little bit thinking, wow, this is a marvelous place to defend until a message from their officer tells them, you're not here to defend anything, you're here to attack. And it is in, it is in that time frame that Vincent's troops managed to get themselves positioned in this way down here. At the end of Vincent's brigade would be the 20th Maine, the 83rd Pennsylvania, the 44th New York, and the 16th Michigan. And all of those guys will position themselves about halfway up, halfway down, the military crest, as they call it, of Southwest Little Round Top. And as they begin to do that, it's going to be a critical moment for the Federals here. And you can all thank Governor Kimball Warren and Strong Vincent for that. But when they begin to get into position here, it's going to have a rather interesting effect. Now, of course, when the Confederates do begin to actually descend here, battle noises have already begun to take place over to the east. Because without a big rock obstacle like Big Round Town, they're already beginning to press into Devil's Den and the Valley of Death to their east, or to their west, actually, over here to their right. And so those noises will begin to generate pressure. And as that happens, some of those Confederates, some of the Texan units, will actually begin to sweep up the pace to the right. So as we begin to explore a little bit of what's going on here, it's not quiet over here. There are noises of battle, puffs of smoke, uh, yells, shrieks, all that good stuff going on over to the right. Now, everybody may be familiar with that good old uh, Gettysburg movie and the continual cinematic enshrining of Joshua Chamberlain. There is other stuff going on over here to the rest of the world. <laughs> now, when the Confederates finally do begin to come down the slope of Big Round Top, over here, there's going to be some considerable stuff uh, that's going to take place. And one of the other things that folks always bring up here is the uh, clash of cultures, if you will, that takes place over here. You know, Joshua Chamberlain, who is he? What's his background? Academic professor. Academic professor. professor. Anybody Maine. know uh, about the background of the guy that's leading the 15th Alabama? He almost killed, he almost killed a guy, right? He almost killed a guy, yes. I have to say that academics don't do that on occasion, but uh, yeah, tavern fighter. You know, that's what you do on a Saturday night. You go into a tavern, you occasionally whale a, uh, a hatchet around, and the only way he found out that he hadn't killed a guy was his brother uh, went back out of the state, told him it's safe to come back, that the guy actually didn't die. But both of these guys have loyal brothers, and both of them will eventually see the power of higher education and will eventually wind up becoming governors of their respective states. Interesting little thing. But they will both have loyal brothers out here in the middle of this all. But one of the jobs of the Alabama troops, when they begin to descend out here, they know that the Tawny Town Road is right off in that direction. They know that if they continue pressing around here, they might be able to seize the road. And one of the joys in an army is if you be be able to get up the road in the rear of an army, you've got the supply of wagons, you've got all those uh, joys of getting into the rear of an army. All the unprepared folks, all the reserves, all the supplies, all that good stuff, and that's what hopefully they might be able to do. So they're determined to sniff around. And of course the 20th Maine is the last unit out here. They've been told they're the last unit, they've got to hold that line. And so Chamberlain has to take his battle position to ranks of men, and he will try and multiply that out a little bit. And of course, as we are here at this point, we're already going down the slope. So what he will wind up doing is pulling from the center of his unit. And if you look right down there, you'll be able to see the monument for the 20th Maine. That marks the color company, where the flags would have been, the center of the unit. And he will take from the center and from the center down to the far left flank and pull those guys out into one line giving him a little more length, but that only works for a while till the Confederates come out and sniff around the back there. But he also knows a little bit about geography. If you begin to wing that back up, you'll be able to 
to make the Confederates work harder and harder. And remember, these are the Confederates that have gone how long, how far? 28 miles, 28 miles in 11 hours. Very good. And they will begin to get more exhausted and more exhausted as they swing back and forth. But of course, for the Federals, it's good to have bullets. And in continual fight, you're issued 40 rounds in your cartridge box and an extra 20 in your pockets when you begin to go into battle. And they just don't have any more than that. So they begin to go over here because that little marker on the end of the line over there marks where they shake hands with the 83rd Pennsylvania. And they try and borrow a couple bullets from those guys. But they're in the middle of a fight too against the guys from uh, Alabama, the 47th over here. And they don't have any more to spare. So they start looking in the pockets and the cartridge boxes of the wounded and the dead. And eventually that will all play out. And we know how this ends over here with the uh, use of the bayonet and the swinging back by the 20th of the uh, Confederates back in that direction. But of course, Oates will do the same thing that Chamberlain does. He will live a long life. He will wind up writing a book about his experiences and he will become governor. And so one of the things that he will share later on is his opinion of just exactly what happens. And it's a rather interesting one because he will tell you a slightly different version of what happened because he's isolated from the rest of the Confederates coming around this way. And he will say this, he will say, I found capturing Little Round Top too great for my regiment unsupported. The historian of the 20th Maine claims that its charge drove us from the field. This is not true. I ordered the retreat. He was, I believe, the chaplain and not present to see it. Doubtless he was at prayer a safe distance in the rear. Colonel Chamberlain believed it, but I ordered the retreat. When the signal was given, we ran like a herd of wild cattle. So from widely differing opinions, they come to a similar taproot that is the truth on both sides. So at any rate, they wind up falling back in that direction. Now the rest of the fight at Little Round Top is taking place on its western face. So we need to get a good look at that before we let you go. So let's head back up maybe about 40, about 50 minutes here, but I'm gonna try and wrap this up. If FDR's voice comes over this thing, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> By this time, the Confederates are flooding over the rocks that you see down below you there. They've swept over Devil's Den, and they are beginning to attempt to come up the more western space of Little Round Top as it projects to my left and my forward here. There's a very serious threat to the federal position here because Vincent's brigade is closed off with the 16th Michigan, that small monument you see there on the rock right down there. So they need, the federals need troops coming up in this direction. And Stephen Weed's brigade will come from the east, coming down this direction here, coming from the Wheatfield Road, coming down at an angle like this to join up, to try and push forward. And the 140th New York will push forward down through here, trying to link up with that. They will also bring with them another battery of artillery. Now you saw those guns that we walked past on our way down. That's Battery D, 5th US. And those guns will begin to try and take a position as soon as they can get clear of the infantry that's in their front trying to link up with Vincent's people here. But as the Confederates continue to swarm over the hill that you see down in front of you there, they are beginning to make themselves at home and they are beginning to set up snipers nests down in that area. Stephen Weed, Charles Hazlitt, and Patty O'Rourke Patty O'Rourke being the commander of the 140th, Stephen Weed, the brigade commander, moving his brigade into position here, and Charles Hazlitt, the battery commander of that artillery, will all be picked off by snipers as they nestle into the position down in Devil's Den. Now the fellow commanding the artillery that originally fired that shot at Warren's request had been waiting for something to happen up here. He's already lost three guns as the Confederates swarm over that position. And he says the first shot fired by artillery up on this crest was music to his ears. 
and the artillery will continue to pound Devil's Den and indicate to everyone there that the Federals will hold this as an anchor. They will continue to plink away at various persons of note and of not note, that is to say your common enlisted types, uh, up through here. But as far as the effectiveness of the artillery up here, one Confederate will comment, it was only necessary to expose a hand to obtain a furlough. <laughs> Little Round Top will be safe and in the Federal hands. The Confederates will retain Devil's Den, but it will be of precious little use to them. The Federals, with the arrival of Stephen Weed's Brigade and more Federals along this way, will continue to build an anchor all the way back to the Pennsylvania Memorial, all the way back to the center of Cemetery Ridge, all the way back to Cemetery Hill. And with the arrival of more than just a portion of the Second Corps, more of the, of the Fifth Corps coming in, they will be able to refill most of the valley here. And with a great deal of blood and treasure, they will be able to recompensate for Sickles' egregious mistake on the midday and Little Round Top will again be an anchor on the Federal left. And they will be able to utilize this high ground with artillery on the 3rd when that barn with the three spires on it will be a problem for the Confederates as they move from far left, that tree line again, as the Confederates come out with their 15,000 men moving from left to right in Pickett's charge and the artillery of now once Hazlitt's battery will fire from these positions and begin to induce many casualties into Pickett's men as they move from left to right towards Cemetery Ridge. That pretty much winds up this program, so you'll need to go from here down towards Devil's Den to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Go get water.